Good morning, everybody. How is everybody doing this Friday morning? I was just thinking on my walk this morning, all of a sudden we're having a cold snap. And yes, it feels like fall, but you know what? There was no mosquitoes and we have had a lot of mosquitoes this week or this summer or this spring, wherever we're at this morning. Okay, let me get my screen all organized. I can see comments. Awesome, we're ready to go. So good morning, everybody. And um, thank you so much for joining me on this Friday morning. Um, as always, if you leave comments during the live, I will answer them during the live. And if you leave comments, if you're watching the replay, just write hashtag replay in the comments. And that way I know to answer your questions because I haven't answered them in the live. If you are watching this live from some of my other pages, like my Shake a Pot Dog Training or my Canine Essentials group, or the private page. I will not see your comments during the live. If you want me to, please go on to the Canine Essentials page. Make sure you're on that page so I see your comments. Okay. Um, as always, please say hello and tell me, what are we going to talk about this morning? This morning, I want you to tell me um, how much time do you spend grooming your dog on a regular basis? This is always something I feel I never do enough of. It's one of those things. And I have a smooth border collie. So I was like, oh, I don't have to groom. And I know I still should probably brush her out, but now she's got all these tufties coming out of her butt. And I'm like, oh, I still have to brush you on a regular basis. But yeah, owning a dog requires grooming. I have been super good about doing her nails, which for me is really good. It's definitely one of those things that I'm not great about. So share that with me, if you will, this morning. And now I'll get started on our subject for today. Today, we are talking about drives and sensitivities. I used to train with a trainer out of Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, whose name was Chris Bach. And she always talked about drives and sensitivities. And that really stuck with me because um, it helps the way I see my dog and see what my dog does. Every dog is born with different drives and sensitivities, even within the same breed, even within the same litter. Every dog is different. Though they're the same and maybe similar, they're still different. These drives and sensitivities are what make your dog your dog. They define personality. They define your dog's wants and needs. Drives and sensitivities are unconscious. The dog doesn't think about them. He just does them. Drives and sensitivities determine how re your dog reacts to things such as food, other dogs, people, things that move, etc. They are wired into your dog's DNA and are part of their survival instinct. Let me give you an example of social drive. Said differently, the need to meet new people. Some dogs love new people and some dogs are like, meh. I remember my very first dog, he was an Akita and strange enough, he loved everybody, he loved every dog he met, loved every person, which is good, but makes training a lot of stuff like pay attention to me or walk on a loose leash super hard because their drive to meet other people is so strong and to see other things. And I used to think it was just, I didn't know how to train it. Like I wasn't doing a good job or he was a bad dog, whatever. And now I realize it's, Understanding of these drives and sensitivities has totally changed the way I train every dog. So this is my example for you. Three dogs walk into a bar. Yeah, I felt like going with that. All three dogs are the same age with the same amount of training and are off leash. So they're all identical in that way. The first dog has a high social drive. He walks into the bar and goes and jumps on every single person one at a time wiggles, licks them, says hello. He loves everyone, loves new people even more. My now 11 and a half year old Border Collie is very much like that. I used to teach a class at Algonquin College. One of the instructors there would invite me in to teach a class. And while I taught, I would let him loose in the room. And I swear, I don't know, there was 30, 40, 50 people in the room. And I'd imagine his tongue was tired by the end of it because as I taught, he would go and visit every single person and jump on their lap and give them kisses and everybody loved him. But it was just so funny. I'm like, you must be tired. So that that's a very high social drive. And as he's gotten older, his social drive has decreased somewhat, which is normal uh, in most dogs. 
most breeds, not so much in labs. Um, but he's very, he's a very social dog. He gets off on being out in the world and visiting. So the second dog walks in, calmly walks up, gives some people a sniff, and then goes and lies down in a comfy corner. This dog would be much easier to teach to walk well on leash in public because he doesn't really need to greet people. They just have no value for him. So much easier to create value for everything else or paying attention to me. This was my Akita bitch, Hudson. She loved me and couldn't have cared less for anybody else or other dogs. If you let her in a room with that many people, she may go up and visit someone. She'd probably go up and sniff the people close to her. If they went to pet her, she was like, meh maybe maybe not and then she'd go lie down and regally sit and watch the room she wasn't scared she just didn't care about people touching her so that brings us to the third dog here comes in dog number three this dog comes in crawling on his belly and instantly finds somewhere protected like under a bench to lie down under some safe little corner where he can watch his surroundings and make sure nobody's going to get him this dog has a high sensitivity to people People are terrifying to this poor dog. His owners are going to have to work very hard to give him good experiences to help him overcome his sensitivities and be able to live in our world, in the human world. Of course, in reality, most dogs are some combination of the above. And this could be with people or children or loud noises. Um, I just wanted to give you how these drives affect it. And again, I've seen these drives in one breed. I've owned all these drives. So post in the comments, what is your dog's drives? What makes your dog crazy? What does your dog love? Does your dog love food? Does your dog love people? Does your dog love toys? Does your dog love swimming? What is it that your dogs love? Good morning, Julie. Julie says, Sisu and Graham, fluffy coats would be magnets. Oh yeah, no. Uh, would be magnets on standard poodle clipping is best. I had uh, a, an acquaintance, a friend who was a poodle breeder and she's like, you need a poodle. And I'm like, no, I don't because they're lovely coats. And I love with that type of breed when their coats are long, but I live in the country. My dog spend a lot of time walking in mud, coming home with furs and stuff like that. I need a easy keeper kind of coat and poodles unless you shave them right down, aren't it? Okay, so the good news is, to some extent, drives can and will change with age and can be changed with training. But it is always good to keep in mind drives are hardwired. That means your dog will always pull back to those behaviors. This is called behavior drift. Let's use the example of a retriever. Retrievers are happiest with something in their mouth. You can teach them to leave your shoes alone, but they are going to have to satisfy that need somehow. You can teach them not to pick anything up, but their need to carry stuff in their mouth is going to always be there. So instead of fighting it, you just got to direct it in something you want. Providing a plethora of toys and teaching them to carry things around is a good solution because it gives you what you want, leave your shoes alone, but it also satisfies your dog's needs to have something in their mouth at all times. And that's what you want when you're training. It's not just about what you want. You also have to take into consideration some stuff that's just going to be easier to create the behavior in a way you can deal with it instead of trying to eliminate the behavior. Good morning, Barb. How is the lovely Poppy this morning? Um, so Knowing your breed type will help you understand your breed's drive tendencies and help you make the best choice when picking a dog for your family. Once you have the dog, this information will help guide you where to focus your training. And notice I said breed type, not necessarily breed. Um, if you have a mixed dog, what do they look like? What do they act like? What type of breed are they? Are they more a herding dog? Are they more a retriever type? Are they a guarding dog? So those are your shepherds, your pitties, your dobes, your rotties. Um, are they more terrier type, you know, a wire coat, usually Jack Russell type dogs. This is, these are breed types. In order to, the, to you want to use this information to develop develop, excuse me, develop the breeds you want and control or prevent the drives you don't want from growing stronger. Some examples of some breed tendencies. 
Terriers were bred, bred to hunt and kill vermin, meaning they have super high prey drive. Probably not a good choice if you want them to live on your farm with your free range chickens. Or be prepared to do a lot of management and training so that the dogs can get used to them. And I'm still not sure if they ever could. Um, herding dogs were bred to herd, meaning they are sensitive to motion and they tend to chase down motion. That means that their default will likely be to herd and possibly nip your fast moving children or fast moving things like children. Start right from the beginning teaching your dog how to interact with your children without hurting them. When I got my first Border Collie, my son was a year and a half. He had started walking at 10 months. So by a year and a half, he was running everywhere. We spent hours training my dog how to be calm around my son and how to not chase him. Scent hounds were bred to follow their noses. Scent hounds are your beagles, your bloodhounds, your, um, why am I not getting another scent hound? Basset hounds. You will have to work very hard on your invisible leash if you want your dog to be able to run off leash safely because their noses will distract them enough that they can't remember they're supposed to also pay attention to you. So you want to build that value for you before the value for their smelling becomes super strong. So a lot of these things, I'm going to talk about that a little later, but a lot of these things, if you can interrupt the development of these drives as a younger dog, you can prevent a lot of the stuff from happening. You will start to see drives with puppies, but you really see them start to develop during adolescence. Like I said above, you can't fully erase a drive, but you can teach a dog how to control a drive. Once fully established, drives are self-rewarding and very hard to change because they're so glued to self, um, to hard wiring uh, that once established, it's so self-rewarding, it's hard to change. Nothing is impossible to change. It's just harder. Good morning, Dorothy. How is our lovely little Billy this morning? Siberians. So for example, I had uh, I had a Siberian. I got him at six months old. Siberians tend to have high prey drive. We did have cats at the time and he was young enough that he was able to get used to the cats living in the house. But unfortunately that did not apply to our outdoor cats. Drives usually kick in seven to nine months. If you can interrupt them from being fully developed before that, you, you have a better chance. And he was good with my cats in the house. Unfortunately, he did manage to get one of the barn cats. Um, you see that often with the high prey drive dogs. They can manage to keep their prey drive under control in the house or with one specific animal because now they're a friend, not prey. But this may not apply outdoors where the thrill of the chase kicks in and their brain goes fully into prey, or it may just not apply with any other animal. So their best buddy little cat is perfectly fine because he's now a cat, not prey, but every other cat is still prey. So just, yeah, drives are interesting and you have to accept what your dog has. So I wasn't happy about his natural instinct, but at the same time, I also needed to, him to learn to control his drive. So I get it. You chase cats. I'm good with that. But on leash, you still have to follow the rules, which means keeping your brain in your head and staying calm. I did this using my ODR game. For those who are new to me and canine essentials, ODR stands for observe, don't react. The ODR game teaches the dog how to watch things like the squirrel in the tree or the cat in the street and not lose their brain. If you are interested in learning more about ODR type, um, in the comments type hashtag ODR or message me to find more about how this game is played. I must say, after a lot of ODR work, Max was really good on leash under a high level of distraction. His off-leash prey drive was still strong, but I could handle that. But his on-leash stuff where I could go out in public was great. This was 15 years ago. The ODR game has come a long way since then. Always learning, always changing. I am currently working with a friend's Jack Russell and my chickens to see if we can manage his prey drive enough that he can be off-leash and keep it under control. Don't worry, the chickens will always be behind a fence and completely safe, but this gives us a great environment to practice it. Okay, back to Max. He was well enough behaved on leash that a cat pretty well jumped into his mouth and really it wasn't his fault. We were at the clinic and they had a resident cat that wandered around. 
I guess that cat had learned to read dogs enough that he was friendly with the calm dogs and avoided the ones who lunged or burped. That makes perfect sense. This was the cat's survival. The problem was Max had fooled the cat. I was at the counter paying my bill. Max was sitting quietly beside me on leash. I was looking at my bill stuff. I wasn't paying attention. I didn't realize the cat was wandering around and decided to walk between me and the counter. So in that whole foot and a half under my dog's face. Luckily, the cat moved quickly because Max grabbed him. As soon as the cat was within, I don't know, this far, <laughs> right under him, Max was like, oh, look, cat. Um, Luckily, the cat was fine and just was bruised where he grabbed the coat. But it reminded me once again, no matter how well behaved he seemed, Max's prey drive was still strong. Now we are going to talk about the other side of the coin, sensitivities. Sensitivities are things that bother your dog. Your dog may be sensitive to loud noises, social pressure, like you leaning into a space, new environments, strangers. The potential list is endless. Sensitivities affect drives. For example, a dog who won't chew their bully stick in their crate when you aren't home, but has no problem chewing it as soon as you get home. This is a dog that's showing you that you being gone is affecting your dog's state of mind, affecting his food drive. What are some of your dog's sensitivities? Things that you know your dog isn't comfortable with. Is your dog scared? Did you have fireworks? We had fireworks the other day. Um, and I live in the middle of nowhere. We don't usually have fireworks that you can hear, but somebody, I don't know how close they were, but there was big noise, fireworks noises. And my young border collie, who hasn't shown any sign of being scared of thunderstorms, which is usually the same as being scared of the fireworks, she didn't, wasn't scared. She barked at them. The, she's in her I bark at a mouse fighting three miles away stage and she would bark at the, th at the fireworks. So instead we worked staying on her bed, which makes barking really hard because to stay on her bed, you have to keep your brain in your body. So we worked staying on her bed during the thunder during the fireworks and teaching her you don't need to bark at the fireworks. Okay, so drives and sensitivities are two sides of the same coin. You are always dealing with both of them. In agility classes, I see dogs all the time that will play with toys at home, but not at class. This is caused by sensitivities affecting play drive. In a class situation, situation, it isn't the dog that is affecting, that this is affecting, but also the handler. Feeling the pressure to perform causing, so the handler puts more pressure on the dog to perform because they're feeling, oh, everybody's watching, I need to perform. You are probably more fun and carefree at home where you don't have all that pressure and and or you don't care if they play, right? You They come up, they're like, play with my toys. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Or if you say, let's play, and they're like, we don't want to. You're like, man, that's fine. We're in class. It's like, no, 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 I need you to play right now. So you may be putting more pressure on the dog or be more mechanical, which will weird the dog out and make them less likely to play because you're affecting the drive to play. So always sensitivities and drives are affecting each other. By teaching the dog skills that require to work him to work and focus, you can work towards overcoming sensitivities. The more sensitive the dog, the more you have questions, the more, the more they have questions. The more weirded out and worried they become, the more they start questioning everything and they lose all their confidence. So you need to go, your criteria when you're working a skill has to drop way down to tell them, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. And then you'll see their confidence start to build. This is a lack of understanding on what they're supposed to be doing. It's a vicious cycle. The more they worry, the more questions they ask, the more they aren't sure, the more sensitive they become, the more they worry. It's just, it's self-rewarding. Unfortunately, the same way you can build a drive, you can also inadvertently build a sensitivity or grow a sensitivity. This can happen so easily and builds behaviors attached to fear, behaviors that keep reinforcing the fear. Um, like you have a dog who's scared to go in the car and you try to get them to go in the car. Come on, come on, come on. And the dog's like, no, 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 no. So the problem is the sight of the car now becomes I run the other way. So now the sight of the car is re every time you try to get them into the car, you're reinforcing how scared they are of the car. So that's a way to reinforce sensitivities. 
most people feel if a dog is worried, they should try to make like, let's talk about dogs greeting people when the dogs are worried about strangers. Um, most people feel if a dog is worried, they should try to make friends with the dog and make it feel better. This is the complete opposite of what you should do. Let me give you a human example. Let's say snakes make you uncomfortable. And if you're fine with snakes, picture something that makes you uncomfortable. Someone approaches you holding a big ass snake. You take a step back, increasing the space between you because that is what you need to keep yourself from running away screaming. And that space might be 10 feet, 20 feet, depends on you, depends on the snake, depends on who's holding the snake. Now the person holding the snakes keeps moving towards you going, no, no, it's a friendly snake, touch it. Do you wanna hold it? Um, you get more and more uncomfortable until you have to leave or you go further and further away. When a person tries to make friends with a worried dog, the same thing is happening. The dog might be able to handle the person standing still five feet away, but if the person keeps encroaching on the dog's space and keeps trying to make friends, this increases the dog's comfort, increasing the fear and cementing that fear in because they're practicing being scared. Now add the leash that prevents them from leaving and all they have left is to defend themselves by growling or in more extreme cases, biting. You don't want your dog to get to this level. You always want to protect your dog. I'm putting a link in the show notes. It's a video of Kevin Hart on The Tonight Show attempting to meet some animals. It's pretty funny and Kevin handled it as best he could, but you can tell he cannot control his fear of these animals. And if there was like snakes, I don't know, a turtle, a bird. He was finally okay. He could handle the bird, but the snake, he was like, no. Nah. I want you to think about this video if you have a dog who is worried about anything, people or anything, and what is happening when you try to force the dog to overcome his fear. With dogs who are worried of strangers, you want to have the stranger completely ignore the dog and give the dog space to approach to the stranger at their own speed. And I wanna make a comment. I have had friendly, super friendly puppies that have gone through a fear period with people in their adolescence and all of a sudden they're like oh no people are scary if you push them in this stage you could create people are scary as a behavior that sticks uh, my super friendly border collie who's now 11 he totally he did it for one weekend <laughs> and but if you have the people sit quietly and ignore him and allow him the room the space to approach them he was like, oh, these are just people. Wait, I know people. I like people. And it gave him the opportunity to go back to what he'd already had reinforced, which was he loves people. So always remember to give your dog the space to investigate on their own. So when the stranger completely ignores the dog and gives the dog space, this will reward the dog's curiosity. Because even if they don't want to be touched, dogs love to smell strangers. They love to smell everything. Smells to a dog are how they investigate the world. With any dog, I want to always encourage and reward curiosity, the need to investigate. With a fearful dog, this is how they're going to overcome fears. And let's face it, even the most confident dog at some point in their lives go, oh, I'm not sure, especially during adolescence. And the more you've reinforce that and allow that curiosity and investigation thing to happen, the more likely they'll be like, oh, wait, what if I move forward? Oh, yeah, that works. And sometimes I'll use food. Sometimes I won't. I won't use food to lure them, but I will use food for the choice to move forward. If instead, when the dog approaches, the stranger bends over and starts to pet, trying to pet the dog, it is very likely this will further scare the dog and cause him to back away. Think of the person with the snake. This will decrease the likelihood of the dog approaching the next person because in his eyes, bad things happen when he is approached, confirming to the dog that approaching strangers isn't safe. With any fearful dog, your goal is to make any experience safe, not what you think should be safe, but what your dog tells you. Watch your dog. He'll tell you. If he backs away, he's telling you, nah, I'm not sure. So you have to, you have to accept that. You have to protect him and go, okay, that's, that's enough for you. Sticking to rules like never allowing anyone to approach your dog if he backs away and accept what your dog is telling you is how you create your dog feeling comfortable, feeling safe to investigate. 
there used to be, there may still be, um, people with worried dogs would hand strangers food to get their dogs to like strangers. This is my caution with that. Most people didn't hand the dog, the per the stranger food until the dog had barked. I have seen dogs that would bark at people so then they'd give them food. The other problem with strangers giving your dog food, and I mean strangers to the dog, not to you, I don't, it doesn't matter. <laughs> when people give your dog food, they tend to go, here's your cookie, totally putting in pressure towards the dog. And that tends to give you a dog who runs in, grabs and runs away. So yes, they're being rewarded for coming in, but they're also being reinforced for leaving because of the relief they get for leaving. I usually do not allow strangers to give my dog food. If I have a super friendly dog, they're already friendly enough. They don't need to like people anymore. And if I, if I have a worried dog, what I'll do is if the dog approaches the person, I will go in and reward the dog using treat placement to, to get the next behavior, such as you step towards the person, I'm going to reward you an inch closer to the person. So you keep moving towards the person. Um, yeah. So that's my spiel on that. I've heard people say, well, my dog should trust me. You have to earn that trust by keeping your dog safe, not forcing him to deal with things he finds scary, but giving him opportunities to choose to overcome his fears, like having the person stand still and allowing your dog's natural curiosity to give you the results you want. Let me get back to sensitivities. All dogs have sensitivities. For some dogs, these sensitivities start to take over their lives, leaving them in a constant state of fear. I've had great success working with fearful or reactive dogs, teaching them to work, to use their brain. When they are focused on the job, they can't focus on the fear, eventually decreasing and even eliminating the fear. This is the last step of my reactive dog program. This is where the dog actually stops being reactive when you no longer have to manage and babysit because the training has done its job. It really doesn't matter what the focus is but the job has to make the dog focus and think. The higher the drive to do the job, to focus, the more likely the dog can ignore the sensitivity. Remember, two sides to the coin, as much as sensitivities can affect drive, drive can affect sensitivities. I'm going to give you two examples. Earlier, you talked about the dog that couldn't eat his bully stick when you weren't home. To change this, we need to increase the focus on the bully stick. When the dog focuses on the bully stick, he isn't focusing on the person leaving, eliminating his sensitivity. Side note, separation anxiety can have many different levels that may not be as easy to solve. If your dog has separation anxiety, make sure to message me or contact a trainer. The longer you work, wait, the worse the behavior will become because, because you always come home and you come home when they're in the state of panic, you are constantly reinforcing separation anxiety. So that's why the behavior tends to increase. I will start by giving, so back to the dog and the bully stick. I will start by giving the dog a bully stick for a week outside the crate. Build a whole process around it, giving the dog lots of cues of what's happening. Do it at the same time every day because then your dog will start to anticipate the bully stick. Anticipation will increase the reward value of the bully stick. You know how they always say with vacations, the anticipation is part of the joy of going on vacation. Same thing with the bully stick. Okay. So for example, at 10 AM, I get up from my desk, I walk over and get a bully stick out of the cupboard and give it to the dog. After a week of this, your dog is like, is it 10 o'clock? Is it 10 o'clock? Is it 10 o'clock? His focus is fully on the bully stick, increasing the drive to that bully stick. Funny thing about fear and focus, you have to focus on something to be scared of it. You can't fight what your dog with you cannot fight with your dog not to focus on something. The more you fight with your dog not to focus on something, the harder they will focus on it. That goes for fears too. But you can build value for your dog to focus on something else. And the more they learn to focus on something else, the less they'll focus on whatever's causing the fear. And this goes for distractions too, right? So I'm not fighting with the fear of me leaving right now. I am just building value for focusing on the bully stick. Before doing the next step, I would have a dog that understands and will willingly go into the crate, something you could be working on the seven days while you build value for your bully stick. Now at 10 a.m., you get up from your desk and you go to the cupboard and you get the bully stick. 
Your dog is all excited. Can't wait for his bully stick. This is fun. He is looking forward to it. His focus is all about the bully stick. To help your dog understand the new game, walk over to the crate, take him by the collar and guide him into the crate. The guiding prevents getting into the issues about going into the crate and losing all the excitement you have built and now the bully stick predicting the fight about the crate. Let me say again, I would only do this with a dog who is comfortable going in the crate and having his collar held. As soon as the dog moves forward into the crate, I would throw the bully stick in. The dog is already really looking forward to this bully stick, so we'll chase the stick in and pick it up and start to chew. Close the door to the crate. Now, the dog may hesitate and go, oh gosh, you just closed the door. That's fine. You're just going to sit right next to the crate where he can see you and you're going to just ignore him. Well, eventually he's like, but I have this bully stick that I really love. She's not leaving. I'm going to chew my stick. And again, this, this game will work for a large chunk of dogs, but not all dogs. So stay close to the crate. As soon as he's done his bully stick, let him out. Repeat this until the dog drives into the crate and instantly lies down and chews his bully stick. Now you're going to repeat what we did above, but you're going to go in and out of the room while he chews his bully stick. You're going to start adding a little more of that fear back in and see if you've built enough focus on the bully stick that he's like, yeah, I don't care. You're leaving. I'm busy. I would stay at this step until your dog leaving the room is a non-issue. You will know leaving the room is a non-issue because you will hear him continue to chew his bully stick when you leave. At first, the first time you leave, you might hear him stop. And dogs are loud in crates, right? Especially if they're chewing something. So you might hear him stop chewing. And I would wait till you hear him start chewing to go back in because that's reinforcing chewing. But eventually you'll just, you'll leave the room and you'll not even hear him hesitate. The last step would be give your dog the bully stick and leave. And you might have to go through a stage of leave the room, but not leave the house and work up to leaving the house. I want to point out again, this is training plan will work for most dogs. Unfortunately, not all dogs with this problem are going to listen to this live and follow the rules. So with some of them, you're going to need some tweaks and changes to make it work for them. This is where my private monthly coaching program is what you are looking for to help create a training plan specific to you and your dog designed to achieve your needs and wants. The second example of how I use ODR and skills to overcome fear or sensitivities is, um, is, oh, lost my train of thought. Sorry, guys. The training, whether your dog gets overly excited or worried is the same. Like I said earlier, a lot of times what I do, whether your dog gets overexcited or worried is exactly the same because a sensitivity is something that affects drive. So a sensitivity could cause excitement um, because it's affecting drive to work for you. So, uh, so they're, they're similar. It is all about teaching them how to keep their brains in their body and stay thinking. Let's say you have a dog that is worried about children. You set up near a playground. You want to be far enough away with your dog to be successful. If you are close enough that there's even a tiny chance that a child could come running up at you, make sure you are uh, behind a fence or the playground's behind a fence. Start with ODR. Leash hand on your body, cookies ready in the other hand. Can your dog watch the children on a loose leash? If yes, reward. If no, meaning the dog has tightened the leash, take a step back, keep your leash hand on your body. Repeat until the dog can watch the children on a loose leash. Ward three to five times, then wait. The dog will be in a position to make a choice. The fact that he can keep the, loose, the leash loose while watching you, while watching the kids, tells you his brain is staying in his body. That's, um, I'm looking for that loose leash watching because that means it's like driving down the street. When you look at the deer and your brain pulls out to the deer, you do this. But when you look at the deer and go, oh, look, it's a deer and keep walking, your brain stays in your body the whole time. That's what you're looking for. Now, the next question to the dog is, can he voluntarily look away from the kids? And remember, the kids could be anything your dog has a hard time with. Remember, to be fearful of something requires focus. When he can voluntarily move his focus away from the kids, that is him starting to let go of the fear and starting to become less sensitive to the kids. I want you to notice I keep saying voluntary, voluntary attention. 
I am not using the food to try to get his attention. I am rewarding him for choosing to look away. This means I am doing nothing. I am giving the dog the space to make the choice to look away. He may not be ready. He may still need to watch. That's fine. That's his choice. I can move then move further away if I want to move to the next stage, or I can keep letting him watch. Both are fine and dis different aspects of the training. One works calmly watching. One works on one works on working while you with you while the distraction is in the environment. They're both important bits. So it's not right or wrong to move further or stay there. And I might do both of those in one training session. Once the dog can voluntarily look away from the distraction and look at me, I ask for a skill. Start simple, something that uses very little brain power. Because even though your dog is looking at you, a big chunk of, chunk of the brain may still be thinking about those kids running around. As for a set, reward three times to maintain, to maintain your stay and then make sure to give a release, either an okay or a break. You want success. Keep it super simple. The dog is figuring out good things happen when he can disengage from the kids and pay attention to you. You do not want failure at this point. You are building confidence, not proofing skills. That you do at home with no distractions. After you release your dog, give your dog the opportunity to watch the distraction again and choose to look away. You are building drive to work with you and weakening the sensitivity. You cannot force it. It has to be your dog's choice. And you want to give them lots of opportunities to make this choice. If you say break, you step towards the distraction, he goes, oh, look, there's kids running around. Okay, what are we doing next? Every time he does that, it becomes easier. Don't be fight. You don't want to be fighting. Going, look, look. Pay attention to me. You got to sit. As you progress through this exercise, you you start to make what what skills you're asking for more challenging. I like to have a number of different exercises to work on that will challenge my dog at different levels. Some easy skills I work on are sit, down, stand, recall, spins. Um, easy and short. The longer and harder the behavior, the more brain power the dog will need to use. Sit pretty requires them to use a lot of muscles, therefore to think really hard about what their body's doing. Heal, it's a long behavior, so they have to stay connected to you, to their body. Um, so that means less connection to the environment. Back up, proofing stays. Can they stay connected on a stay? With stays, I only reward when the dog is looking at me. If I ask for sit, he is more than welcome to turn his head and look at the distraction but the cookies only come when he's looking at me. Uh, bow, shake a paw. Remember, you are not working on these skills. You are working on ignoring the distractions and keeping failure very low. Always keep in mind, the more you challenge your dog, the more brain your dog will require to complete the task. That means the less brain they can give to the distraction, in this case, the kids. Eventually, you would go to the spot and start working and all your dog will care about is working with you the kids become irrelevant. And that's where we're going to. The more you work through these sequences in different locations with different distractions, the easier this choice, these choices become for your dog. Sometimes I would work closer with easier skills and sometimes further with harder skills, always keeping success rate high to build confidence. Understanding and accepting your dog's drives and sensitivities is one more tool when training your dog. All dogs have drives, some weaker, some stronger. All dogs have sensitivities, some weaker, some stronger. These are just more reasons why cookie cutter dog training doesn't always work. Why you may be watching those YouTube videos and following them to the letter and still not working. Your dog is still doing whatever or your dog still won't do whatever it is you were hoping for. If you are interested in getting one-on-one -on -one help to get a personalized training plan to guide and support you on your training journey, message me for more info on our canine monthly coaching packages. Thank you so much for giving me your time this morning. Let me check. I see a comment. Um, Julie, are there any differences in ODR technique for fearful versus excitement? Sisu gets excited when she's reactive. No, the ODR stays exactly the same regardless of excitement or fearful. Um, because a lot of dogs who are excited are actually fearful. It's just they're the way they display the fear. 
um, yeah, it's just the way they displayed the, the fear. Oh, Julie again. ODR sounds the same for both personalities. Yes, very much. ODR is something I do with every single dog all the time. It is, it's a concept. It it, it is a very laid out skill, but it's also a concept. It's the concept of staying calm regardless of what's going on. So even though Wicca is like the least reactive dog I've ever had, but is it because she's been doing ODR since the day she came? home at eight weeks old of me understanding if you want that of her understanding if you want that you have to calm yourself down now you get it and the longer I do it the more I put it into everyday life in every interaction with my dog um but yeah whether my dog is fearful or nervous I'm looking at the dog can the dog look away from the distraction can the dog work with me can the dog listen to me when that's going on but if you had an overexcited dog, it's just their display is different. One might get all poopy and oh, I'm not sure. And the other one will get, bah, right? But the my response is still the same. Can you stand on a loose leash? Great. A fearful dog may be able to stay on a loose leash, but can't interact with you. So then he'll give you other signs that it's not working. Uh, let me know if you have any more questions with that. Okay. Um, thank you again for taking time to listen to me this morning or whenever you're listening. And I will be doing another Facebook Live Friday at 10 a.m. Have a wonderful weekend and we will see you next week. Bye, guys.